Upon your walls, O Jerusalem, I have posted sentinels. All day and all night they shall never be silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it renowned throughout the earth. Imagine those sentinels standing on the thick hewn walls of Jerusalem. Early evening sun slants across dusty limestone, bathing wall and sentinel alike in a golden glow. The warmth might relax those preparing to end their work for the day, hurrying through the streets toward friends or toward home. But on the ramparts, there is no time for relaxation. Watchful eyes anxiously probe the velvet shadows as nightfall approaches. Darkness envelops the city. The watches of the night pass. And finally, streaks of light appear at the edge of the Kidron Valley to the east. Morning dawns in Jerusalem. All freshness and dewy grass, coolness not yet burned off by the heat. And on the walls, the sentinels are still there, leaning forward, muscles taut, dark eyes narrowing to scan the horizon. These sentinels are not just military lookouts. In the dramatic theological landscape of Isaiah, these sentinels are prophetic figures watching for the fulfillment of God's promises. Prophets in the ancient Near East were understood in religious and cultural terms as boundary figures between the human and the divine. The wrenching laments of Jeremiah and the turbulent servant songs in Isaiah alike show us that prophetic intermediaries live in a terrible intimacy with God while suffering an acute awareness of the vulnerability of being human. Walter Brueggemann speaks of the prophets as mediating disruption. Prophets see what is at stake in the failures of their community. They are particularly acerbic regarding the community's insistent refusal to acknowledge crisis, whether military or moral. But prophets not only respond to crisis, they catalyze crisis by their shouts of impending doom, their urgent exhortations to understand and to change. Prophets speak, this is Brueggemann, in images and metaphors that aim to disrupt, destabilize, and invite to alternate perceptions of reality. The prophets and the prophetic books compel us into their liminality, into life on the threshold. And they insist that disruption of the status quo, Yale, is a holy state of being. Heeding the prophets means knowing that communities gathered around scripture are to be present to God and to the real world at the same time. Communities truly formed and reformed by scripture have no choice but to serve in that excruciating place, loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the neighbor, the real neighbor as ourselves. Atop the bulwarks protecting Jerusalem from its enemies then, Isaiah's prophetic sentinels strain to see the Lord bringing the exiles out of Babylonian captivity across the wilderness, back to their own fields of grain, their own vineyards, back to the dusty walls of their beloved Jerusalem. Isaiah is speaking to those who have vision, to those who can glimpse the purposes of God for restoration 
even when displacement has fractured the community's resilience. Sentinels, those who dare to call out a word of hope, even when despair has settled heavily on the hearts of a people that seems to have lost everything. Isaiah is preaching to what Eusebius of Caesarea called the prophetic choir of all those who, as intercessors, boldly implore God to respond to the needs of the poor, the oppressed, and those who mourn. And so, as we celebrate the beginning of a new academic year here at Yale Divinity School, Isaiah speaks to us. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones. Each one of us here this afternoon is called to walk with others out of captivity into freedom. Whatever your degree program or your administrative role, whatever your intellectual passion or your area of ministerial expertise. If you gather with others around the book of Isaiah as God's holy word, you are called to help build pathways that will enable people to journey toward wholeness. Together, we are charged to clear every obstruction, seriously, every obstruction to prepare the way for those who are sure they have been forsaken. Not easy work. To be sure, we are not entirely unequipped. Our inherited theological traditions are rich indeed and far more creative than we sometimes give them credit for. The worship life here is an extraordinary and life-giving blessing. The gifts and wisdom and convictions of this community are remarkable and continually energizing. And most important, because we are a community gathered around scripture, gathered around the enduring and imperishable word of God, we are made strong by that word for service and for witness. But the needs of the world are vast. You know this. When we look up from our books, we see brutal ethnic and religious violence destroying lives across the globe. Closer to home, we hear of record-breaking levels of crime and desperation in New Hallville, just three blocks west of this divinity school. When we look up from our books, we learn how carefully orchestrated are acts of political violence directed against the bodies and spirits of women and LGBT folks in many cultures, including our own. If we close our books, yes, a professor is telling you to close your books. If we close our books and listen really, really hard, we might even hear the thunderous silence of elite systems of higher education regarding the educational needs of the poor. The prophets tell us that the pursuit of truth is inextricably linked with justice, since justice has to do with naming the truths of suffering, exploitation, and captivity. Justice has to do with working to realize the truth of liberation in the lives and histories of communities. So what we do here at Yale Divinity School, the scribal interpretive acts, I personally am very fond of them, the creating of text and art and ritual, the construction of communities of care, what we do is necessarily about mediating the purposes of God for justice in this world. Those who have chosen to belong to the YDS community own, as our mission statement puts it, an enduring commitment to foster the knowledge and love of God in whatever ways we can conceive in this wondrously multifarious theological education project. 
That phrase, to foster the knowledge and love of God, is defining for us, is constitutive of what our work seeks to do at its points of deepest traction. Yale Divinity School is very unlike a secular college or university in that regard. As David Kelsey has said, love for God is not only an emotion, but is also a fixed attentiveness, trying to understand the beloved. Teaching and learning make for truly theological schooling. Only when they are all done in service of a further end, learning so to love God with the mind as to come to understand God more deeply and more truly. What does it mean to learn to love God in the liminal space inhabited by the sentinel? What does it mean to teach and learn in relational ways, ways that render us vulnerable to the disruption mediated by others' truths? I want to consider with you briefly curricular and pedagogical implications, if that's all right with Greg. <laughs> Curricular and pedagogical implications of teaching and learning in liminal, intersubjective spaces. Necessary first, I think, is a brief word on my social location. I began here in 1991 as an MDiv student called to ordination and passionate about liturgy and feminist theology. In a dusty summer Hebrew classroom with a broken window in the basement of the not yet renovated north side, I experienced the beauty of biblical Hebrew as unexpectedly breathtaking. I was stunned. To my own amazement, I dropped foundations of liturgical study. <laughs> and um, <laughs> crept, I know, well, and I'm still reading, I'm still reading to catch up, even today, even today. Um, regretfully, I dropped it. <laughs> and I crept, quite terrified, into Bob Wilson's Hebrew exegesis of Genesis, which, by the way, we'll meet on Thursday at 9 a.m., if you are interested. <laughs> If you take that class, you will see, as I did, two things. The first is that Bob is not nearly as scary as you might think. <laughs> Mysterious? Yes. Sphinx-like? <laughs> Absolutely. But actually alarming? Not in the slightest. The second thing you will see is this professor's astonishing erudition and his unreserved delight in biblical narrative. It is only slightly hyperbolic to say that Bob's Genesis class changed my life. Thank you, Bob. After a year of protracted vocational wrestling, and I commend the Anand program to each one of you, I switched to the MAR in Old Testament Hebrew Bible. I was thrilled to continue my study through the Yale doctoral program, and I was blessed beyond measure to secure a position on this amazing faculty. I rejoined the ordination path in 2007, was absolutely transformed by clinical pastoral education at Griffin Hospital on my sabbatical in 2009. I think there was a Dale Mail recently about Griffin Hospital. Take a look if you're thinking about it and was made a priest in the Episcopal Church on April 21 of this year. So I, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> props to God. Um, so I speak to you as one who has been committed to YDS for 21 years, as one who cherishes the MDiv curriculum for the theologically profound work of art that it is as one who preaches, celebrates, and teaches regularly in the church, and as one who breathes as very oxygen the rigorous theorizing of biblical interpretation.
My hope in sharing all this is to convince you of one thing and one thing only. My credential to speak with you this afternoon is not the PhD. It is not the job title. It is the fact that whatever your formational plan here may be, I love much of what you love. Now, every space between and among persons learning in community is a liminal space, a threshold space, in which each participant is continually changed and made new in relation. As Martin Buber and Emmanuel Levinas have taught us, intersubjective space is holy. Truly intersubjective educational space, not the space of monologue of the credentialed expert holding forth from an unassailable place of privilege, but the space of honest dialogical learning in community. This kind of space requires wrestling with difference. The spirited epistemological disputes that one can trace among Job, Proverbs, and Kohelet in the Hebrew Bible testify to this. The fabulous polyphony of the Pentateuch confirms it too, and Joel Baden will tell you all about that <laughs> starting tomorrow morning. Polyphony. Ask him, say, Joel, tell us about the polyphony. <laughs> oh, he'll tell you. He'll tell you. It is in confronting difference that witnesses ancient and contemporary have learned to articulate an honest living narrative, a story that grows in depth and complexity as competing truths are spoken. Wrestling is hard, but it is essential for understanding the limitations and contingency of the self. Oh yes, postmodernism is starting to creep into biblical studies at Yale. Contingency, I say, of the self. Wrestling is essential for responding to the embodied truths of others. Wrestling honors the holiness of intersubjective space, as Peter Hawkins knew when he proposed the biblical Jacob as a patron saint for theological education at Yale Divinity School. Yale is all about excellence. I'm not hearing the excellence, <laughs> right? All the promotional materials and development brochures say so. I submit, I submit to you that excellent theological education requires wrestling with surprising and unanticipated truths, daring to stay put in those risky threshold spaces that exist among persons and community, among competing questions, and among contestatory epistemologies and interpretive frameworks. So what are some curricular and pedagogical implications of all this? First, we may ask what it means to prepare the way for the people, the prophetic cry, prepare the way for the people with an eye to curricular excellence. In recent years, theological education has been moving steadily toward curricular structures that honor integrative, contextual modes of learning. Decades ago, field ed, as it used to be called, had been the main site for any learning involving the practices of pastoral care or liturgical leadership in real communities. Field ed was ghettoized in many theological schools. It was implicitly and sometimes overtly treated by biblical scholars, theologians, and church historians as a paracurricular add-on that could not claim anything resembling intellectual rigor. The myopic and parochial nature of that perspective probably goes without saying today. At least I fervently hope so. But it was not always so clear. The locus of power in theological schools was in the classic theological disciplines, which were carefully defined according to traditional Western Enlightenment categories of rationality, perpetuated through pedagogies that focused on the successful transfer of content and technical skills to dominant culture males of the next generation, and often then robust, robustly defended against interdisciplinary incursions. I would cry too if that was still the situation. 
blessedly, models of teaching have changed significantly from days of yore in North American higher education when famous academic experts held forth concerning the facts they happened to know, passing on as a first importance the method, usually in the singular, in which they had been trained, a throng of disciples anxiously taking notes at their feet. Times have changed. Praise be to God. Sharp and persistent challenges have been raised for many decades now to that old model of education, from Paulo Freire's groundbreaking pedagogy of the oppressed in 1970, to feminist deconstructions of the implicit norms of patriarchal educational formation, to newer collaborative epistemologies and liberatory practices advocated in womanist ethics and queer theology. We understand much better now that the mastery of a narrow lexicon of scholarly jargon is only one indicator of expertise, and a rather anemic one at that. I will pause to say to each one of you in this room, never be ashamed if you don't know a word that someone's using. That's not important. Ask them to tell you what they mean. Never be ashamed. We understand better that teaching and learning always constitute complex acts of power in relation, and that wisdom, rightly understood, may be found in many different sources and contextual expressions. In a word, we have been moving toward a more integrative and holistic conception of curricular structures and pedagogical practices. While the pace of change at Yale can be experienced by some as glacial. I'm delighted to report that YDS is responding with increasing agility to the emerging new landscape of integrative and interdisciplinary teaching and learning. From the recent travel seminar to Uganda and Rwanda, to the new fall class taught by Willis Jenkins, Lucinda Huffaker and Kyle Peterson, social justice, Christian ethics and community engagement to the upcoming spring collaboration between Peter Hawkins and Marcus Ratai on the Psalms in literature and music. The YDS curriculum is becoming increasingly robust in its commitment to integrative pedagogies. Traditional disciplinary learning may always be the bedrock of theological education at YDS. It remains to be seen under Greg's leadership. But excellence is being redefined in higher education as increasingly collaborative and contextually shaped. This constitutes an important invitation to our traditional disciplines to speak more and more adeptly to a broader and more complex audience. And I say now to students here, if you suspect that your faculty have not heard the invitation clearly enough, encourage them to listen. Invite them to accept the invitation. We are in this with you not apart from you, with and for you. Yale Divinity School is not yet a leader in this dimension of excellence, that must be said, but with sustained attention to capacity building and a more convincing attentiveness to our New Haven context than we have mustered heretofore, I believe we can make a significant contribution to North American theological education in this arena. And so I encourage us to continue to teach one another in the development of interdisciplinary courses and context-based integrative learning, in ongoing conversations between the brilliantly interdisciplinary Institute of Sacred Music and its partners on the Quad, and in the ways in which we seek to frame questions that burst narrow disciplinary constraints. Prepare the way Clear it of stones. Isaiah's imperative requires that we identify and remove obstacles from the path so the community of exiles may proceed on the journey toward restoration. What are the stones that we must clear here at Yale Divinity School for scholarship and teaching and ministerial practice to flourish in ways that honor contextual wisdom? What obstacles must we remove in order to build the capacity of this community to witness as fully as it possibly can to the purposes of God for justice? The ancient Christian interpreter Jerome saw the stones that must be cleared as our sins, those things that cause our hearts to stumble 
in spiritual progress toward Christ. While sin is doubtless at play in every instance in which someone feels alienated or disempowered in these storied halls, I am more interested today in deconstructing a major pragmatic vulnerability in the theological education product, uh, project as it has traditionally been conceived here. Here goes. Yale Divinity School has been unapologetic and at times fairly unreflective about the narrowness of the cultural norms by means of which it frames the implicit or unspoken curriculum here. Normative for generations have been discourses and frameworks of meaning proposed by a relatively small subset of Western European and North American intellectuals trained in academic environments that have systematically ignored women, people of color, openly queer folks, and the poor. Excluding those from credentialing processes and often enough excluding them from the ranks of students as well. Valiant the YDS has been in the pursuit of excellence. This particular theological school has not been among the spryest, the spryest in leaping toward a more progressive understanding of the constituencies involved in the intellectual project. I'm happy to report that YDS did tenure its first woman in New Testament ever in my wise and accomplished colleague, Adela Collins, whose model has meant so much to me in my own professional development. They tenured Adela and no cracks appeared in the foundation of the school. <laughs> And so YDS was emboldened to tenure its first woman in Old Testament ever in 2008. Two whole women tenured in Bible. The chapel steeple has not fallen down as a result. I'm fairly certain the scaffolding you've observed around our architectural pinnacle has had nothing to do with the presence of two tenured women in Bible here. Under the leadership of our new dean, YDS may well take more steps in the direction of inclusivity. This will require, of course, thrashing in the jabbock of cultural, gender, class, and sexual difference. But remember, wrestling is good for muscle tone. <laughs> and to any who might be anxious at the prospect of injury, I'd respond gently that some of us have already been limping for years and years. Excellence lies a bit further out toward the horizon on this score than we might wish. But at least we are closer than when we first believed. And for that, I praise God. It's time to draw the circle wide.
calls us to build up the highway for the exile's return home. This will necessarily involve telling our stories. To the extent that we are wise and reflective about the ways in which our intellectual pursuits and our moral and political commitments illumine one another in our embodied living. If we don't know how to analyze that organic nexus of pedagogical theory and lived praxis, I don't recall a class on it in my uh, doctoral work, don't recall. Oh yes, in the MDiv curriculum there are some helps for that, that's right. Uh, if we don't know how, we need to acquire the tools to do so. It is, after all, a very old endeavor. Harry Attridge, musing on education in Israelite wisdom circles, as refracted through Proverbs, has rightly noted that in that historical context, teachers and learners handed on what tradition had provided and took seriously what experience and observation taught. Thus, our stories matter profoundly for who we are and how we know. So students, if you come across a class in area one or area two or anywhere in our curriculum that seems implicitly to rule out of bounds the nuanced critical engagement of our own embodied and lived experience in community, you can suggest cheerfully that both the Bible and Harry Attridge recommend a broader pedagogy. <laughs> Redemption comes about not in abstract, disembodied terms, but through people's lived experiences of God's healing, restoring, and reconciling work. Finally, and very briefly, what will it mean for this community to take no rest in reminding the Lord that we wait for justice? In what ways and for which causes should we take no rest in this place? My colleague Jan Holton has insight to offer from her field work with the orphaned lost boys of the Sudan. In her book, Building the Resilient Community, Holton makes visible three dimensions of Dinka culture that allow displaced and profoundly harmed children to recover and even flourish, despite their having experienced astonishing levels of trauma that included famine, torture, disease, regular attacks by lions, prolonged unaccompanied travel toward Kenya or Ethiopia during which journeying, it is estimated, tens of thousands of children died. The resilient community to which Holton witnesses first created a safe communal space marked by care and pastoral attentiveness, even in conditions of deprivation. Second, took care to articulate justice in terms of mutual moral obligation and demands for equity. And third, created a collective faith narrative that gave voice to their suffering and so could sustain them. The Lost Boys' insistence on naming injustice and suffering within their narrative of hope, that reminds us that our own narratives wherever and however we construe and construct them, must be truly collective and must acknowledge the reality of ongoing violations of community, even as we seek justice, even as we look for the fulfillment of God's promises. These then are the three dimensions of teaching and learning that I would lift up as we prepare to go forth into the new academic year. You who remind the Lord, take no rest as you strive to create safe communal spaces marked by care and pastoral attentiveness for every single member of this community so that we together may be strengthened to engage the joys and struggles that we meet not only within these ivied walls but out into the streets of New Haven and beyond. You who remind the Lord, take no rest as you seek new ways to articulate the power of moral obligation and compelling ways to demand equity, 
both within this beloved elite system of education and in all the landscapes of ministry. You who remind the Lord, take no rest as you work through biblical studies, theology, history, ministerial studies, cultural studies, to weave an honest collective narrative that names suffering, violation, and conflict for what they are, even as this narrative articulates the grounds for our shared hope. Theological education is demanding. It will require of each one of us, faculty, staff, and students, energy, generosity of spirit, courage, and yes, resilience. Thank God we're in this together. Let's get to it.